If it's all right with you, I've got something on my heart I want to I want to share this morning. So if you've got a Bible, you go ahead and pull it out. Find the book of Numbers, the book of Numbers, chapter six. And uh, just a special hello to everybody that is watching online right now. We've got people tuned in all over the globe. We love you. And uh, we pray God's word dwell richly with you, uh, just as it is here with us today. And as well, what's up to everybody out on the plaza? This beautiful Southern California morning. We love you as well. You know, sometimes on a momentous weekend like this, it can be a little intimidating to figure out what to preach, what to share. And as I began to pray through this last week, not just what was on my heart, but what was on God's heart to share with each and every one of us, I was drawn to Numbers chapter six into a familiar passage of scripture that many of you will recognize the moment we start to read it. Numbers chapter six, verse number 22 says this, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and his sons saying, this is the way you shall bless the children of Israel. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. And then God says this in verse 27, so they shall put my name on the children of Israel and I will bless them. These verses are what's commonly referred to as the blessing. It's also known as the priestly blessing or the Aaronic blessing. It's also known as the lifting of hands blessing or even the three in one blessing. And just make a mental note of those last two, more on those in just a few minutes. But if you've been to Cottonwood uh, over the last seven or eight years, you've probably heard me pray these verses over us as a benediction at the end of the service. And uh, in 2020, um, Christian music artist Carrie Job turned these verses into lyrics and wrote a song called The Blessing. And when that song came out, I can't tell you how many people in the church came up to me. They're like, Pastor, Pastor, they wrote a song about your prayer. And uh, <laughs> while I appreciate the sentiment, I can't take credit for it. It's not my prayer. It's actually God's prayer. It's God's prayer that he wanted prayed over his people. As a matter of fact, it's the only recorded prayer in all of scripture that's written by God the Father. Like that's, that's really weighty. The only prayer written by God the Father. He dictated and prescribed a prayer. And it's written here word for word in the book of Numbers and it's to be prayed and declared over his people. By the way, God never teaches a prayer so that he can deny answering that prayer. His desire is to bless his people. And then just a sort of an interesting note, in 1979, some Israeli archeologists were digging in burial caves near Jerusalem and they found two little silver amulets, small, worn as a piece of jewelry and over a period of years, they ran tests on these amulets and they discovered that inscribed upon these amulets in ancient Hebrew, written word for word in its entirety, was this blessing that we have here in Numbers chapter six. And uh, you're just gonna have to forgive me for a second, I'm gonna nerd out with you here, but, but what, really, what really blows my mind about this is that these amulets, they, they date back to the seventh century BC. That's the time of Solomon in the first temple, which makes them actually 400 years older than the Dead Sea Scrolls, which means that the oldest biblical text that we know of in existence today is this blessing, this prayer that God himself wrote for his people. Like, I don't care who you are, that's, that's cool. <laughs> and what I wanna do today is sort of put the magnifying glass to these verses. I wanna highlight a few things, because I want them to become more than just eloquent words that we hear or that we pray. I actually want us to be able to engage with understanding when it comes to this text. But more than anything, my prayer is that through these words, we would get a revelation and an understanding of the Father's heart toward us. Can we pray and then we'll dive into it? God, we love you so much. And we come to you this morning in the name of your son, Jesus. We just wanna say thank you for your word. We pray today by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would teach us according to your word. We pray as the psalmist prayed, revive us, O God, according to your word, your word that you've exalted even above your name. Today we give it our full attention. And we pray that through your word, you would help us and shape us to be more and more like Jesus. 
And it's in his name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, let's, let's dive into this text. Maybe just keep your Bible open. We're going to refer to these, these verses. But in order to grasp what's written here, we actually have to start with a proper understanding of what biblical blessing really is. Uh, because for most of us, at least here in America, um, we have either a reduced understanding of blessing or an abused understanding of what blessing is. Um, reduced in the sense that often we turn blessing into a bit of a, a social pleasantry. Right? Someone goes, hey, how are you today? And you go, blessed. If you're feeling really Christian, you say, I'm blessed and highly favored. Um, in, in the South, they throw around this phrase, oh, bless his heart, oh, bless her heart. Um, which usually comes on the heels of an insult. Oh, she's not so pretty. Oh, bless her heart. Um, <laughs> or, or we use it to sign off on a text or an email. I did this just yesterday. Finish the email, blessings, and then put your, put your name. On the other end of the spectrum, our understanding of blessing can sometimes be abused. Think about the insincere televangelist who's trying to sell you the blessed handkerchief for 50 bucks that's been dipped in, in holy water, right? This is not the biblical understanding of blessing. So this morning, let's throw out the abused and let's throw out the reduced understanding and versions of blessing and let's try and get a true picture. And in order to see the true picture, we have to go to the scriptures. And blessing in a Jewish culture, or blessing in biblical context, um, it goes all the way back to the beginning. You can go back to the first book of the Bible. We see God blessing even in the garden at creation. You can read this Genesis chapter one, verse 27 and 28. God creates Adam and Eve. And the first thing it says after that is this, that God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply. So the biblical precedent for blessing, it actually goes all the way back to the very first chapter of the Bible. And I love the fact that it's God pronouncing this very first blessing. We keep moving through the Old Testament. We have the patriarchs, guys like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they are constantly pronouncing blessing upon their children and their posterity. You remember the story of Jacob and Esau? Remember how scandalous it was, how big of a deal it was when Jacob stole Esau's birthright and his blessing? It was such a big deal that once the blessing was pronounced, it couldn't be taken back, it couldn't be reversed, and it couldn't be switched. So blessing in a biblical context is more than just nice words spoken over people. There's something very real, very powerful, very tangible about a biblical blessing. Think about the, the covenant that God makes with Abraham. He says, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. And I'm going to bless those that bless you. And through you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. Blessing is a big deal. And blessing actually is one of the key themes that we find throughout the Old Testament. And then we jump in the New Testament. We find blessings again, especially seen in the work, in the ministry, and in the person of Jesus. Right? Think about the Sermon on the Mount. Blessings abound. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the meek and mild. Blessed are those who mourn, and on and on. And how many times is it also recorded of Jesus? where he would come and let the little children come to him and he would lift them into his lap, lift them into his arms and he would bless them. So blessing from a biblical framework, it involves the supernatural transference or an impartation into or onto the receiver of that blessing. It's the act of declaring God's goodness and his favor upon other people. And it's not just limited to words. It includes the tactile and the tangible. Even the definition for the word blessing in the Hebrew language shows us this. And, and by the way, Hebrew is a really, really neat language. It's what the Old Testament was written in. But, but Hebrew, uh, the words in that language actually paint a picture. And, and the definition of the word blessing in Hebrew literally means to get low, to bend down, or to kneel beside. So catch the picture here. When God blesses you, it's as if the all-knowing, all-powerful, all-present God of the universe bends down, kneels beside you so he can touch and embrace his child. And this word blessing, it also infers the idea of bestowing or giving a gift. Here's the best way I know how to illustrate this. Um, I travel uh, a lot. 
It's, it's part of my job. It's part of my calling. God has graced it. Um, I, I enjoy it for the most part, but one of the, the downsides of so much travel is often I'm away from my, my family, and I, I love my family. I love my wife and my three boys, and, and I tend to miss them terribly, and the longer I'm away, the, the more I, I miss them, and I look forward to getting home, and oftentimes as I'm on my way home, I'll stop off in the airport, and if I see something that reminds me of them, I'll, I'll pick it up and put it in my suitcase so I can give it to them as a gift when I get home. And, and there's nothing better than getting home from a long trip and walking into the house and having one of my boys run up to me with their arms extended. And it's usually my seven-year-old because let's be honest, my teenagers are just too cool for school these days. <laughs> but my seven-year-old will run up to me with his arms out wide. Are you, are you seeing this picture? Right? And as my son runs towards me, I get down on my knees. And I kneel down so I can get eye level with him, so I can go face to face and I can fully embrace him. And as I'm embracing him, then I reach into my suitcase and I'm like, hey, I was thinking about you. I got you this. That picture right there, that's the best way I know how to describe the biblical definition of blessing. God Almighty, he kneels down into that intimate space so that he can embrace his children and impart to us the good and the perfect gifts of heaven. I'm reminded of James chapter one, verse 16. He says this, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the father of lights in whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Is this not the summation of scripture? Right? We, we, we see it time and time again. God comes down to bless those whom he loves. We see it in the garden. God came down. And he walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. And as we read earlier, he blessed them. We see it in the Exodus account. God comes down, meets with Moses on Mount Sinai. He meets with him face to face. The scripture says as a man would meet with his friend. We see it over and over throughout the Old Testament where God would come down and meet his people by filling the tabernacle or filling the temple with his glory, with his essence, with his Shekinah presence. We see it in the New Testament. And this is perhaps the greatest example we have of all, that God came down in the person of Jesus, blessing us with the greatest gift of all, forgiveness, salvation, and right standing with the Father. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul would talk about this gift of Jesus, and he would say it in these terms, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15. He would say, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Indescribable. In other words, all languages, all descriptors, all superlatives, they fall short in describing the blessing we have in Christ Jesus. And when we consider this, we must conclude with full assurance that God desires to bless his people. It is the indescribable gift that God would condescend to come down to our level and meet us where we are at. And truthfully, I take great hope in that fact because that means wherever I am or wherever you are in the faith journey, God's heart toward us is that he wants and he desires to bless us. Now, just to be clear, that doesn't mean that God exists as a cosmic genie to make us wealthy or to give us a problem-free life. On the contrary, we were created for him. He was not created for us. Yet he desires to bless his people. And God's greatest blessing toward you is not wealth. It's not to give you a problem for your life. His greatest blessing toward you and towards me is the gift of himself. First having come in the person of Jesus, but now through the personal indwelling of his Holy Spirit. God's greatest blessing is nearness to himself. And we experience that through his ever abiding presence and it's there in the place of his presence we find everything that we need. We have blessings of peace there in his presence. We have blessings of guidance there in his presence. We have blessings of friendship and healing and provision, all found in his presence. And this, my friend, is the biblical definition of blessing. Amen. So now that we have that framework, we can dive into Numbers chapter six. And again, just as a refresher, this blessing, these are God's specific words given to Aaron the priest, and he was instructed to declare them and to pray them over the people. And you'll notice this blessing is broken into three distinct sections. Each of these sections start with the words, the Lord, right? The Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. And I mentioned at the beginning that one of the names for this blessing is the three-in-one blessing. In Jewish tradition, we'll call it that because there's those three sections that start with the Lord. But I'd also add that now being able to look at this text through New Testament eyes, it actually lends itself toward teaching and toward complementing the Trinity. Right? We serve a triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Three distinct persons, but one and the same God. And as we jump into this blessing, what you're going to see is that the first section, it reflects perfectly the heart and the will of the Father. The second section reflects the person and the work of Jesus, the Son. And then that final third section is a mere image of the fellowship and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So just something to keep in mind as we read through this. So let's look at the first section. The Lord bless you and keep you. Bless you and keep you. Let's look at this first term, bless. In this case, it's literally speaking of material and practical blessings, but not in a crude sense. And what I mean by that is that we shouldn't look at this as though it were the prosperity gospel, like God's plan for us is to have the mansion and the Lambo and the, the you know, huge bank account. Um, and, and as well, not, not to say that those things are bad, God's not even against those things. Actually, the Bible says that God gives us all things to enjoy. However, the problem comes when those material things begin to take God's place upon the throne of our lives. Because more than anything else in this world and in this existence, God desires of you and of me. He desires our heart. He wants our obedience. He wants to matter more to us than all the stuff. That's why I always pray, like, God, help me and, and teach me to be the kind of person that you can trust with lotto money. You know, you know what I mean? Lord, help me to be that person that would do whatever you want me to do with it. But when we hear this phrase, the Lord bless you, we mustn't think of, uh, of material blessing in this sort of obtuse, kind of crude sense. It, 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 it's, it's not just a blanket statement. It's actually very personal and hand-tailored. Notice it says, the Lord bless you. Yeah, yeah, it's prayed over the crowd. Yes, it's prayed over the people, but it's very personal. It's hand-tailored. The Lord bless you. It means God sees you. Out of all the crowd, he knows you. The details of your personal situation are not lost on him. And remember this definition for blessing. He kneels down beside you. He's not standing over you. He's near and he's present. Dare I say, he understands your situation even better than you understand your situation and his desire is to get to you exactly what you need. Remember the scripture says he clothes the lilies and he feeds the sparrows. The Bible says that even not a single bird will fall from the sky that he doesn't know about. The Bible says that the, the very hairs on your head or lack thereof are numbered and known by him. That every tear is captured. And what God wants he wants to bless us with both physical things and practical things. The Lord bless you. So for the infirmed, he wants to bless you with healing. For the businessman, he wants to bless you with, with customers. For the parent, he wants to bless you with, with wisdom and discernment. He wants to bless you with patience. How many of you know we need patience when it comes to raising our children? For the lonely student, God wants to bless you with godly friends. This is the nature of our Father. He knows us. He loves us. His desire is to bless us with both practical and physical blessings, but not just bless us. He wants to keep us. And this is a shepherding term. It literally means to, to gather up to one's heart. It means to guard. It means to encircle. It means to surround, to hem in or to hedge around with, with thorns. And the picture that's associated with this word, this, this word keep is that of a shepherd who would lead his sheep or his flock to, to usually a cave or, or a rock wall. And then he would build a bit of a, a semicircle enclosure or pen around them. He'd use thorn bushes and these thorn bushes would keep the sheep in at night and keep the danger out. And the shepherd would lay down right at the door of this enclosure. This is the picture God is painting for you when it says the Lord keep you. It speaks of his protection his covering, and the fact that he's holding your life together. 
As a matter of fact, I'm reminded of the words of the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 1. He's, he's come to the end of his life. He knows he's about to give his life as a martyr for the faith. And these are some of his last words that he writes to his young protege, Timothy. This is what he says in verse number 12, 2 Timothy 1 and 12. For I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep. He's able to keep what I've committed to him until that day. And in this case, Paul is talking about committing to God his life his salvation, committing to him the results of his ministry. He says this in the, I am persuaded that he's able to keep, he's able to guard, he's able to hold the things that I've committed to him. This morning, let me ask you a question. What have you committed to the Lord's keeping? Your family? Your kids? Some of you, you've got college students that have gone away to school and you're no longer in a position where, where you can control what they're being exposed to. Have you committed your college students to God's keeping? Have you committed your future? Have you committed your finances, your business, your career? How about most importantly, have you committed your eternity to him? Jude, the brother of Jesus, would write this in Jude 1 and 24. Now to him, to God, who is able to keep you able to keep you, to guard and hold you, able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. God, he's able to preserve you and to keep you until that day. But let's be honest. How often do we try and hold things together here in this life on our own? We try and run a business. We try and raise a family. We try and make our mark on the world. And oftentimes we do it without consulting or without committing these things to God. And if you're anything like me, when I try and make this life work in and of my own power, in and of my own strength, in and of my own intellect, it usually comes crashing down and falling on its face around me because I'm just not that smart and I'm just not that strong. So I'm really grateful that even when I screw things up, I can come to the Father and I can repent and I can say, Lord, help me, forgive me for trying to do this on my own. Forgive me for not committing it to you. And God is so kind and he's so faithful to forgive me and to meet me there in that space of my mess and take control. Martin Luther, the famous reformer, he said it like this. I have held many things in my hands and I've lost them all but whatever I've placed in God's hands, that I still possess. The Lord bless you and keep you. And then it says, the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. This this second section speaks about spiritual blessings. The first was about practical and physical. This second section is about spiritual blessings. The Lord make his face shine shine upon you, literally meaning may the Lord illuminate his face upon you. And throughout scripture, the concept of light is a metaphor for the word of God. You'll remember these verses, Psalm 119, verse 105, your word, O Lord, your word, your word, O Lord, is a lamp to my feet. It's a light to my path. Psalm 119, verse 130, the the psalmist says, the unfolding of your word gives light. So so this concept of God shining on us speaks of spiritual revelation and blessings that come to us through the word of God. David, the psalmist would say it like this, Lord, open my eyes that I might see wondrous things from your word. He's speaking of spiritual revelation, spiritual blessings that come to us through the vehicle of God's word. And then notice it says, the Lord make his face, his face, his face shine upon you. So so shining is about revelation coming through the word, but his face is about revealing his person. Oh, I love this so much, his face. I love this language. He wants us to sense and to feel his warmth through his face. How many of you know you can learn a lot about somebody by looking them in the face, right? It, It reveals what's actually in the person. I, I might even go so far as to say that one's entire being is revealed in their face, right? There's an old adage that the eyes are the window to a person's soul. I don't think that's very far off. You know, recently I, I was with one of my boys and they were trying to convince me of some outlandish story that they had heard at school. They'd heard it from a friend and they were convinced it was true. And I wasn't buying it for a second. And my son could see that I had my doubts, so he pulled me down, he pulled me close, and he said, Dad, look at me. Look at me. 
And he proceeded to retell the entire story. And then he goes, dad, now do you believe me? <laughs> to which I said, no, but I believe that you believe the story. <laughs> Why? Because I could perceive the truth in his face. You can look at somebody's face and you can tell a lot about that person, whether they are soft or sincere. You can tell if they have joy or sadness or anger or mischief in their eyes. You can tell if they're, they're nervous or annoyed. You can see whether or not they have confidence. It's all seen. It's all shown. It's all reflected and illuminated in somebody's face. And here's the thing. God requires of his people that we seek his face. David, the psalmist would say it like this in Psalm 27 and verse eight, when you said, seek my face, my heart said, oh Lord, your face, I will seek. So the question becomes, how does one seek the face of God? How does one get a revelation of God's face? Here's your answer. We see it, we do it through the person of Jesus as he is revealed to us through his word. Hebrews chapter one and verse three says, Jesus is the brightness of the Father's glory. He's the express image of the Father's person. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6, the apostle Paul would say like this, for it's God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown now in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Listen, Jesus wants to shine in your life and he wants to show you, he wants to reveal to you who the father really is. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Be gracious to you. Simply put, what does the face of God emanate? It emanates grace towards you. If you haven't heard it before, this is the beautiful message of the gospel that God has not dealt with us as we deserve to be dealt with. Instead, he poured out his wrath for sin upon his own son who willingly took our place. The wages of sin is death. And Jesus was crucified and put to death in our place. He died for our sin and the scripture said he died as our sin. As he hung on the cross, the father turned his face away from Jesus. It's recorded, Jesus said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken? Why have you turned away from me? Let me tell you why God turned his face away from his son so that he would never have to turn his face away from you or from me. And if we will put our trust in Jesus' finished work on the cross, if we'll put our trust in his resurrection from the dead, we then experience this grace. Our lives then become hidden in Christ and we get to experience the face. We get to experience the smile and the warmth and the acceptance and the embrace of the Father. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And in the final section, the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. His countenance, his countenance. This expression can actually be interchanged with that word face that we read just a moment ago. The countenance, it includes all the details of God's nature and his persons, but the difference between countenance and face is in one little detail we see here in the text, the word lift. The Lord lift his countenance upon you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you. This implies that God is below us, not in rank, not in station, not in order, not in importance. Of course not. It does not mean that. It's not what this verse is talking about. But God is below us when it comes to posture. He's looking up at us. A couple of things here. First, to be below in posture is to assume the role of a servant. It's to take the posture of humility. I'm reminded of the words of Jesus. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. I'm reminded of the actions of Jesus. In John chapter eight, he's confronted with a woman that's caught in adultery. And the religious rulers say, Jesus, this woman, according to the law of Moses says, she needs to be stoned, but what do you say? And I love Jesus. He kneels down. 
He gets down in the dirt, down in the muck, in the mire. He gets down in the mess of this woman's life. He gets eye level with her. And instead of condemning her, instead of throwing stones at her, he says, I don't condemn you. And he reveals his kindness and his grace. I'm reminded of Jesus on the night before he would go to the cross in John chapter 13. It's recorded that he kneeled down and he began to wash the disciples' feet showing us a picture of grace, an example of what it looks like to serve other people. So first and foremost, this idea of God lifting his countenance upon us reveals his nature, reveals his posture. He's one of a servant. He's one full of humility. But secondly, this lowly posture causes us to actually revisit the illustration I shared a minute ago about coming home from a long trip. And this used to work better when my boys were, were smaller. They're all huge baby dinosaurs now. But when I'd get home, after I'd kneel down and embrace that son, I would then stand up and I'd lift them. And I'd pick them up and I'd look them in the eyes so that they could see my smile so that I could feel my warmth and my delight in them. And in that moment, that particular child that I'd be lifting, looking up at is the only person in the world that existed. In that moment, that child had my full attention. And if you were to see my face in that moment, what would you see? You would see warmth, joy, and pure delight. And if you were to look at my child's face in that moment, what would you see? You would see total, total contentment security, knowing that out of everybody in the world, my dad, he, he sees me. This is what it means for God to lift his countenance upon us. It's you personally knowing and experiencing the smile of the father. It's you experiencing and knowing his tender love and affection. It's you knowing beyond all shadow of a doubt that his favor is towards you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. The word peace is the Hebrew word shalom, and it's the highest blessing that can be bestowed. That word shalom literally means to fix or to amend what is deficient or broken. And along with this word comes the connotation of rest, of joy, of well-being, of spiritual wholeness. So this final declaration reveals God's heart for his people that he desires us to be whole, to be complete spirit, soul, and body. And the peace or the shalom that God brings, it's a peace that the world does not understand and it's a peace that the world cannot offer. I was reading something the other day and I stumbled on this quote from author Tyler Stanton. This is what he said. Right now, we're living in the most socially conscious, globally minded, social justice oriented generation in living memory. We're also the most mentally ill and chronically unhappy. We're a generation of people doing exactly what we want to do with our lives, but yet we are completely overwhelmed, utterly exhausted and chronically anxious. Listen, something is amiss. Something is off. Something is drastically wrong with this world and we all know it and we can all feel it. There is a restlessness and it's palpable. I think St. Augustine, he summed it up best and he gave the solution in one sentence. He said, our hearts are forever restless until they find rest in thee. Listen, there is only one answer for the aching and the restlessness in our hearts. And that answer is to know and to experience the blessing of true rest, true shalom that only God can give. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Here's the final thought I wanna leave you with. It's, it's a picture and as well a point of application. Go back to your text, Numbers chapter six, verse 27. God ends by saying this. He says, so they, so the priests, they shall put my name, they'll put my name, they'll put my name on the children of Israel and I will bless them. 
Maybe you'll remember this at the beginning of the sermon. I said one of the names for this blessing is called the lifting of hands blessing. And the reason it's called that is because when the priest would pronounce this blessing on the people, they would, they would lift their hands. They would lift their hands and they'd make a particular shape with their hands. It, it kind of looked like this. Sort of like an exaggerated, exaggerated W. For all the country music fans, it's sort of like Waylon Jennings logo. This, this exaggerated W and it formed the Hebrew letter Shin. And the priests would hold this letter up with their hands as they pronounced this blessing over the people because Shin, this letter, it stood for the abbreviated form of the word Shaddai, which is the name of God, El Shaddai, God Almighty. And Jewish tradition records this, that the priests would stand with their, their back to the temple and the people would be before them and they would pronounce this blessing and they would lift up the name of God with their hands as they pronounce the blessing. And tradition says that God's presence would fill the temple and the Shekinah glory of God would be so bright that as the priests lifted their hands with this symbol of the name of God, it would cause a shadow to fall on the people. Literally, God would place his name on the people as they declared this blessing over them. So they, the priests, they shall put my name on the children of Israel. And God said, I will bless them. One more scripture and I promise I'm done. Luke 24, if you got your Bible, Luke 24. Let's go to the New Testament. Luke 24, Jesus, this is him post-resurrection. He's gathered with his disciples. He's just given them the great commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every nation, every creed, every tongue. He's about to ascend back into heaven. But look what it says in verse 50. And he led them out, the disciples, as far as Bethany. And he lifted up his hands and he blessed them. He's pronouncing this very blessing over his disciples. He lifted up his hands and he blessed them. Now it came to pass while he blessed them that he parted from them and he was carried up into heaven. And then notice what the disciples did. And they worshiped him. And they returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. So Jesus, he finishes his earthly ministry by pronouncing this very blessing over his disciples. First and foremost, I think that's awesome. But look at the effect that this blessing had upon his disciples. And this is what I believe should characterize a people who have been blessed in this way, which by the way, that's, that's us. And here's our point of application. Number one, they, they worshiped. They worshiped. They lived lives that ascribed glory to God. Does your life ascribe glory to God? Every area, every facet, every avenue of your life is a worship. You're giving, do you consider it to be worship? You're serving, do you consider it to be worship? Or is worship just when we come in and fill this space and the band is on the stage? It's every area of our life. There's no compartmentalizing. It's not Monday through Saturday. We do what we want to do. We live how we want to live. Sunday comes out. We pull our Sunday best out of the drawer and then we worship. No, every part of our life is spiritual worship unto the Lord. And for those of us that have been blessed, the outpouring, the outflowing is that we live lives of worship. Here's the second thing they did. They returned to Jerusalem. Oh, I love this. They went back on mission and they did it with great joy. They had just been commissioned, go into all the earth and preach the gospel. They went back into Jerusalem on mission, blessing other people. And again, all of this, it flows from having received the blessing of the Lord. And how appropriate on a day like today, on an H4 miracle offering, where we realize we've been blessed to be a blessing. And we're on mission, the great commission Churches all over the earth on mission together, bringing a living Jesus to a dying world. Come on, let's pray together. God, we love you so much. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your blessing that you put upon your people. Where would we be without your intervention in our lives? Oh God, we love you so much. We love you so much. And we pray that you would use what's been shared today to reveal to our hearts how good, how merciful, and how loving you are to each and every one of us. 
And Father, for anybody now that is under the sound of my voice that doesn't yet know you in this personal and intimate way, for anybody that's not yet surrendered their life to your Son, I pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you would reveal to their hearts right now their need for a Savior. I can't do it. I'm not eloquent enough. I'm not smart enough. So Holy Spirit, would you speak to their hearts? And would you reveal their need for Jesus? Would you convict them of sin? And would you convince them that although their sin is great, there's an even greater Savior that loves them and took their place? And Holy Spirit, I pray for those you reveal the need for salvation to, you would give them as well the courage to speak out and to cry out for help, to cry out for forgiveness, to cry out for salvation. And I thank you that you meet them there in that space. That you rescue them and bring them into the kingdom. And God, I pray you bless your people and that you keep your people. That you cause your face to shine on them. Lord, be gracious to them. Lift your countenance upon them. And give them your peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.